Chapter 8 Ned! Nancy threw her arms around the tall, broad-shouldered young man. Sorry to keep you waiting. Have you been here long? Nancy had found Ned sitting on the plush velvet sofa in the hotel lobby. Got here just about five minutes ago, Ned said, bending down to give her a powerful hug. A lock of thick hair fell forward over his eye, and Nancy brushed it away. I want you to know, she said, her mind still reeling from her frenzied afternoon. Your visit is the one bright spot in this entire trip. Uh Uh-oh. Sounds like my favorite detective is wrapped up in a tough case. What's happened since we talked on the phone? Nancy let out a sigh. First, I had so few real clues that I didn't even know if I had a mystery or not. Now, all of a sudden, there are all sorts of leads, and I don't know which ones to follow first. Nancy could see George coming across the lobby with the room keys she had picked up from the front desk. Listen, why don't you come upstairs and I'll tell you everything. A few minutes later, the three friends were seated around the table in the main room of the suite, drinking the Cokes they had ordered from room service. Nancy and George recounted the day's events, from the newspaper headlines about Barton to their library research. Ned looked thoughtful. So you think the trail of evidence could lead to that record producer? Harold Marshall, George supplied. Right, or the Nordqvist woman, or even Alan? Ned's voice dropped as he uttered Bess's boyfriend's name. So, I'm sharing a room with one of your suspects, Nancy. Nancy shrugged. I haven't even seen Alan since you called, so I haven't had a chance to ask him about sharing his room. And once I confront him about his lie... I'm not sure how generous he's going to feel about doing any favors for my friends. Nancy twisted a strand of hair around her index finger. But don't worry, there's a couch in Dad's room. I'm sure he wouldn't mind having you stay with us. As if on cue, the door to the suite opened and Carson Drew stepped inside. Ned, well, hello. I thought I heard your voice. It's good to see you again. Ned stood up and they shook hands. Good to be here, Mr. Drew. So, Carson Drew turned toward his daughter and George. Anything new on the case? As a matter of fact, Dad, yes. I was wondering if you could arrange another meeting between me and Anne Nordqvist. I need to talk to her. I'm sure she'd be happy to. In fact, I'll ask her tonight at dinner. You mean you're having another business meeting? Nancy wondered if she should tell her father that Anne Nordqvist was on her list of suspects. No, she decided. She'd keep it to herself until she had more information. Carson Drew liked to tease his daughter to remind her that her detective's methods were a direct contrast to his own lawyer's procedure. Not exactly, he replied. Actually, I asked her to dine with me more for pleasure. Nancy felt a chill race through her. For pleasure, she echoed dully. Normally, she would have been happy that her father had a dinner date. Her mother had died when she was a very little girl, and she felt it had been too long that her father had done without female companionship. He dated occasionally, but for the most part, when he had free time, he threw himself into extra work projects. But Anne Nordqvist... The woman had seemed nice, but Nancy couldn't get the China connection out of her mind. Yes, for pleasure, Carson Drew chuckled. Your old father deserves to enjoy himself occasionally. And I find Anne Nordqvist a very attractive, highly intelligent woman. Nancy swallowed hard. Oh, she said, exchanging looks with George and Ned. Well, I I hope you have fun. Her voice came out in a high, tight squeak. What if her father were going out with one of Barton Novak's kidnappers? Psycho Killer Psycho Killer 
vintage rock blared from the speakers, and dancers spun beneath the ultraviolet lights. The club was a study in downtown funk. A stage had been set up at the front, and the people milling around in the crowded room ranged from the utmost in fashionable to the totally outrageous. Wow, check that get up, Ned said, tapping Nancy on the arm. A girl with a rainbow-colored bristle of hair walked by the table where they sat, her slender body draped in black satin and lace. What? Oh yeah, I see her, Nancy replied distractedly, glancing at the girl for only a brief second. Quickly, she turned her attention back to the entrance of the club, which was visible from her balcony perch. The second Alan and Bess walked through that doorway, she wanted to know about it. Nan, they'll be here soon, Ned assured her gently. Meanwhile, you might as well enjoy yourself. How often do you get to come to a place like this? He reached out and trailed his fingers up her back. Nancy could feel the electric tingle of his touch. She inched her chair closer to his and rested her head on his shoulder, the softness of his sweater caressing her cheek. Oh, Ned, I'm sorry. I guess I'm not a very good date. You're the best. I just wish I could do something to cheer you up. Ned, sometimes I don't think I deserve you. You come all the way from school to be with me, and I'm so wrapped up in this case I'm no fun at all. Hey, it's okay. This is me, remember? I've stuck by you during lots of tough cases. I know what you're going through. Nancy lifted her head and looked into Ned's brown eyes, her gaze holding his. You're not mad at me, are you, about what happened on the last case? She couldn't quite bring herself to pronounce Daryl's name. Sure, she'd been a willing victim of Daryl's sexy eyes and smooth personality. But it had been Ned who'd bailed her out of a dangerous situation during that case and Ned, who had been there for her once the criminals were safely behind bars. Ned cupped her face in his large hands. It hurt, sure. I mean, if it hadn't, I'd have to start wondering how much I really love you. And Nancy, I do love you. Nancy held her breath, afraid to break the spell of the moment. But when Ned's tender gaze left her face, she followed his glance. Alan! She was on her feet, the tough detective back in top form. Let's go! Nancy and Ned flew down the back staircase and caught up with Alan and Bess at the coat check room. The attendant was already hanging up George's coat. She must have gone ahead to check out the dance floor. Nan! Hi! And Ned! Bess gave him an exuberant hug while Alan greeted Nancy easily. Hi, how are you doing? Nancy steeled herself. I'd be a lot better if I could figure out why you lied to me about seeing Barton Novak. Bess spun around, looking like she'd just been slapped. What do you mean? Her voice rose. Alan wouldn't lie, would you? She asked, moving quickly to his side. Alan looked from Nancy to Bess, and then back to Nancy. I, uh... Bess was gazing up at Alan, who met her eyes and held her glance for a moment that seemed to go on forever. Nancy watched nervously. She couldn't imagine anything worse than getting caught between them. No, Alan said finally, his voice stronger. Of course I wouldn't lie. You told me you saw Barton wearing his purple bandana, Nancy said accusingly. That's right. Alan, the security guard at Radio City Music Hall, found Barton's bandana last night after we left. He's had it ever since. Alan's cheeks blazed under the colored lights. Well, maybe, maybe there are two bandanas. Nancy felt a rush of annoyance. Why was Alan playing games with her? You know as well as I do that it's a one-of-a-kind good luck charm. Every article written about Barton mentions that. Alan shifted from one foot to the other. 
Bess's gaze was still frozen on him. So, uh, suppose I remembered wrong. Suppose he wasn't wearing the bandana. What's the big deal? He raised his eyes and looked at Bess, a note of pleading in his voice. You believe I saw him, don't you? Of course I do, Bess responded. She whirled to face Nancy. What's gotten into you? She snapped. Bess's angry tone stung Nancy like a bitter wind. Bess, I don't mean to hurt you, but I don't think Alan is telling the truth. Doesn't it strike you as a little weird that in the last two days, one of the few people to have any contact with Barton Novak is someone who barely knows him? Not even Barton's sister or his best friends have heard from him. Why would I lie? Alan said, after what felt like an interminable pause. I feel kind of like Barton's my brother. I mean, I learned all about rock and roll from listening to him. Now we're even recording on the same label. That's just it. Frankly, Alan, your instant success hasn't felt right to me since the second you told me. We all know how good you are, but you're not a professional. Not yet. And world is a label for professionals. You know what I think? I think Harold Marshall offered you that contract in return for throwing me off the scent. Nancy waited for Alan's response, but it was Bess who jumped forward her face inches from Nancy's, her hands clenched. Nancy Drew! I thought you were one of my very best friends. What a jerk I was. Alan got that contract on talent, pure talent. And if you're too dense to realize that, at least you ought to keep your opinions to yourself. She spun on her heels, grabbing Alan's arm and maneuvering him away. We don't need to waste our time with people like that. Nancy heard her say. Wait, Bess! Nancy called out frantically. She started after her friend, but Ned put out a restraining hand. Nancy, why don't you wait until she's cooled off? She's never going to cool off, Ned. Bess is going to hate me forever. Nancy watched her friend storm off, rigid with fury, never once looking back. End of chapter 8 